Y'all have been hilarious this week to ask me about what's coming up and little giggles in the hallway. Seventh commandment, tee hee, right? It has been real entertaining for me. Um, and we have before us another commandment like, like last week that is very much one that we understand that's very much a don't, don't do it, amen, sit down. Um, that didn't happen last week, <laughs> sorry. Uh, it's not going to happen this week, it can't happen. Um, real quick as we start, how about, I'm going to name for you a time period in the United States, an era, that maybe you were a part of, maybe you survived or lived through or loved, maybe you weren't born yet, I don't know, I'm going to name for you an era, a time period in the U.S., and I want you to just give me words that describe that time period to you as you understand it. Even if you weren't there, how you understand that time period. So I'm just going to say the 1960s. 1960s. Some of y'all are smiling. Some of y'all remember the 1960s. Some of y'all don't remember the 1960s. Some of us were not even twinkles and eyes, right? 1982, born. What's up? Um, so, give me some words. What do you think of? What comes to mind? Hippies. Awesome fashion. Change. Awesome word for the 1960s. What else you got? No responsibility. Music, yeah. No responsibility. Drugs, thank you. That's a lot of big one. No responsibility. No responsibility. <laughs> what Martin, Luther Martin Luther King Jr., some big time civil rights <laughs> historic figures. Anything else? Peace and love, man. <laughs> right? Vietnam. 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 Big war conflict. Anything else? Cuba. I can't. Cuba and Kennedy, big time. Anything? So here you go, that's, that's 89, but big big stuff going on. Uh, so Hazel, I think, would have been, well, maybe 70. What's that? Camille, thank you. Somebody that was alive, thanks. <laughs> Richard, yes. <laughs> Anything else? The moon. Okay, so big stuff. So change is a great word. Uh, revolution was a big word that was thrown around. Social revolutions of all different types. And so you hear about drugs. You, you hear about really a time in our country when some long-standing, really sacred stuff, and even not so sacred stuff, kind of got pushed back against, or protested, or uh, revolted against, or even just questioned and deconstructed. It's a traditions and institutions. It's a big time. Civil rights, women's uh, women's rights. Uh, and so on. So it's a big deal. So a piece of the 60s was the sexual revolution. Uh, one of the big pieces of the social revolution. A big piece of the sexual revolution was the free love movement. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah? The free love movement. And so it's just like it sounds. These are folks who felt like love needed to be set free. And what does that mean? Set free from what? So these are folks, this was a movement that said uh, our laws and our tax code and our government, our churches, our traditions have basically put love in jail. In other words, put sex in jail. There's no way to say that. Our laws and institutions, that our institution like marriage has basically become um, a hostage keeper over, over sex. And the free love movement, folks in the free love movement said, we, don't, we need to throw those things off. And so what was the primary way that they did that? You don't have to say it out loud, I don't want to. Okay, so in the words of Marvin Gaye, they said we should all just... Get it on, right? Just, uh, yeah, that just happened. I said that. <laughs> That's where we are today. We just we're gonna have to deal with it. Um, free love movement said it's all good. Free love movement said our sexuality is a lot like our other desires and passions, uh, just like our hunger. God gave it to us. It's good. It's holy. Um, you've got a feeling in your stomach. It's time to eat. You've got a certain feeling. It's time to get it on to satisfy that need. There's nothing wrong with it. There's nothing uh, unnatural about it. The natural state of things is just to satisfy that need because we all have it. Okay? So free love. Set love free. Okay? That's, a, that's one way to look at it. <laughs> uh, we know that the church pushes back against that and in some ways says, that sounds grand, uh, but in some ways it almost rather sounds like making love cheap or making sex cheap. Too free. So free that it's too easy. So easy that it's too undervalued. Okay, and the church pushes back. C.S. Lewis, who we're going to hear from a little bit today, I, I discovered C.S. Lewis probably about age 20, um, and kind of in a real way. And so it's a time when in men's Bible studies in every circle that I was in in college, 
Um, sexuality and relationships and marriage were constantly at the forefront. And so C.S. Lewis just always blows me away. He says over and against this idea of free love. And also, I don't want to pick on the 1960s. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand if that was your, your era and you loved it. Um, we're not going to pick on the 60s because we know that the free love movement was really tapping into uh, a message that has always been available since the beginning of time, which again is that you know, sex is a natural passion. We hear First Corinthians from many thousands or many hundreds of years ago, a statement like the stomach is for food, so why not eat the body? has sexual desire, so no, why not satisfy it? This is nothing new, but the free love movement did give us a way to kind of wrestle with that. I mean, it also certainly influenced where we are today in terms of Hollywood and media and sexual images before us all the time. Those things have their roots pretty heavily in that time period. So, I'm not picking on it, but C.S. Lewis says over and against all that message that has been around for a long time, he writes in the 30s and 40s, well before the sexual revolution, he writes it this way. He says, chastity, chastity, sexual purity, chastity, chastity oh, well, is the most unpopular of Christian virtues. Amen? There is no getting away from it. The old Christian rule is this. Either marriage with complete faithfulness to your partner or else total abstinence. He says, now this is so difficult and so contrary to our instincts that obviously either Christianity is wrong or our sexual instinct, as we now understand it, has gone wrong. It's one or the other. I think that's really valid. And so we've got free love folks who say sex should be free from all restriction regulation. And we've got the church that comes back and says, belongs in monogamous, lifelong marriage. That's a tough two things to wrestle with sometimes. What are some of the qualities, I want you to talk to me again, what are some of the qualities of marriage as we, as we treat it? Think about the ceremony and what we do before, during, and after the ceremony. What are some of the qualities that we use to define a Christian marriage? What do you got? I just named lifelong, right? I, I said monogamous. The one partner, trust is huge. What else you got? Specific to Christian marriage. Communication. Communication is big. In sickness and in health, we have vows, very intentional vows that we've been using for a long, long time. Why would we use intentional vows? Maybe so that we don't sneak and only put in the things we want to put in and leave out the things we don't want to have in there. Yeah. So we have, for the most part, standard vows. What else you got? There's intentionality there, right? What else? Think about the things in the ceremony, the things we do. What are, what are some of the things we do before people get married as Christian people? Counseling. What does the minister require? Counseling. Counseling. It has to be a counsel, prayerful decision. For me, and for probably every night Methodist pastor you'll ever find, you can't get married without a counsel, prayerful approach that takes time and planning. I mean, it can be quick sometimes. Don't get me wrong. We're not going to, you know, it can be weeks or whatever you want to do, as long as we feel like we've had time to counsel in prayer. It's a big deal. What else do we have? You hit vows. What's that? God, thank you. It's a service of worship. Yeah. A wedding is a service of worship. So if you ever have that conversation with Eddie, uh, our music director, about what music is appropriate in, no, you can't walk out to the final countdown, right? You can't walk out to your favorite butt rock 80s song, okay? Because, no, it's a sacred, it's an act of worship. It's a time of worship. That's a big deal. That's something that Christian church sets aside. How about, for the most part, there's a proposal. Anybody? Sometimes elaborate, ridiculous. Go ahead. And, this is one of the only things on this particular Sunday I want you to raise your hand for, okay? I can ask you to raise your hands a lot. Yeah? Right? Okay. How about raise your hand, brides, if your husband has just an awesome proposal situation for you? Okay, we got a few. <laughs> I got some husbands who are like, yeah, it was good. Raise your hand. Okay. So sometimes we've got intentionality even in the lead up to the point of proposal. That's a big deal. Um, how about this? How about this? It's not just a, a, a ceremony, um, but it's public. 
Marriage in the Christian church is public, okay? As in there's at least a minister there, and we usually encourage you to have some community of faith there with you, right? Okay? It's official, there's an efficient, it's legal, which is a big deal. And we can go on and on a little bit more. What I'm saying is you could, you could find ground for the free love folks to say, that is, why do you jump through all those hoops just so that it's okay to have sexual contact with somebody? Why, why on earth? That is not, set it free, right? And our pushback would be to say, that list of things that we just named, it's not a really cool way to think about it, but it's almost a list of pre what prerequisites. It is almost the application that somebody needs to bring to your door if they even want to consider having sex with you. That's reality. That sex is powerful enough and good enough and holy enough and valuable enough and lasting enough that unless somebody walks up to you and says, this is it for life, you're the only one, just me and you. We're going to make it public and shout it from the mountaintops. I'm going to propose properly. Your parents are going to know about it. A preacher's going to be there. We're going to have counseling and pray about it. And it's a service of worship that we are not treating it substantially enough. If somebody isn't willing to at least go that far for you, they have no right to approach you for your sexuality. And if we're not willing to offer that to someone else, we have, we have no right to approach them to engage in their sexuality. And that gets a lot of our, our, our wrongdoing when it comes to sexuality. Because there's no way when it comes to pornography or adultery, etc., 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 that we can make a public declaration before God, or that we can serve the other person, or that we can promise fidelity. It's impossible. And so God tells us to push back let me tell you about true freedom. True freedom is not settling for less than your worth. And you've heard that probably a million times, but we need to hear it again. That's what our sexuality is about. So as we go to Matthew chapter 5, we've got this tension between two worlds. The free love idea of it feels good, do it, it's natural, it's all good. Yeah. And some of us know that in the 1960s of the free love movement, it got a little weird. Yeah? Let me just say that. Communes, it got weird. Okay? And this thing can go weird if it goes wrong. Um, and on the other hand, we've got the church's witness. I don't want to talk about it as prerequisites or hoops or an application or whatever, but a sense of what you deserve. Okay, so we go to Matthew chapter 5, and Jesus teaches. Again, we're in the same Sermon on the Mount where Jesus opens up on this commandment, Thou shalt not commit adultery. And he teaches us how it can run a little deeper. Jesus says, You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust, or a man, we'll say, everyone who looks at another person with lust has already committed adultery with them in their heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one of your members than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. If your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one of your members, again, than for your whole body to go into hell. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. <laughs> Thanks be to God. It's a good word. Thanks be to God. <laughs> so real quick, so you're saying, Josh, um, the week we talk about sex, one well, of the few times that Jesus talks about sex, he talks in terms of cutting off body parts. You hear that? You know what I'm saying? That's not what we're saying. <laughs> Ever. <laughs> Under any circumstances. <laughs> I just thought it was funny. Did y'all not get that? The first time I read it, I was like, Jesus, I'm talking about sex and getting all geared up for week seven. Cut it off and throw it away. I'm like, whoa, bro. Whoa. <laughs> but for real, Jesus takes us past just the surface level for the second time. Not just killing, but anger. Not just adultery. This public, physical, outward act, but our inward self, it's a big deal. Um, the reason I think Jesus felt the need to tear into this, you can imagine, imagine people in his day, a people who were just ingrained with do not commit adultery. Okay, that line had been drawn in the sand for them for thousands of years. They knew there was no good. People could get stoned for it. It would totally dishonor your family. Adultery was just no good. The problem, again, we know with the law, is that because they had this line in the sand, 
maybe people felt like they could get as close to that line as possible without actually crossing it, and then God would be okay with it. In other words, as Jesus said, I may not actually physically go out there and have sex with somebody else that's not my spouse, but what if I do everything but that? What if I creep right up to that line and enjoy everything but? And so thoughts, words, right? Some actions. And so we know that Jesus was dealing with the people who thought that their lust could be something that cohabitated with their heart. Lust was something that could coexist with their, their faithful, godly heart somehow. As long as, as long as they never did anything about it. Okay, you hear that? And the second sense that I get from that is that Jesus was tackling people who thought it's a very free love idea. That these, these urges, these desires that are just natural to me, they're going to have to live in me. And I know that because I'm a person. Okay, it's very free love. Uh, and, and not only that, but as long as I don't talk about it or do anything about it, then it's okay. And as long as I don't act out on my spouse, then it's a harmless crime, right? Who am I hurting if I think a certain way or fantasize a certain way, but never let it become action? Yeah? Does that make sense to us? It's what Jesus was tackling. But we get a response from Jesus that says, whoa, whoa, fellas and whoa, ladies. Is God concerned with the contents of our hearts and our minds? Yes. Is our spouse concerned with the contents of our hearts and our minds? Are our hearts and our minds a part of what we pledge in our, our weddings and our marriages? Yes, absolutely. Scripturally, wedding, marriage is a bond between man and wife that is physical, spiritual, emotional, mental, um, as they become one flesh. That a very cool, cool biblical language for marriage, which means, yes, we pledge even that hidden part of ourselves to our spouse, and it matters. Why does it matter? Because our sexuality is something that is too powerful. Lust, when our sexuality goes wrong, lust is too powerful to play around with. That's what I hear from Jesus. It can't just coexist in your heart. It's going to overrun your heart. How do we know? Uh, so again, to kind of respond to the free love movement, this idea that it's a natural desire that needs to be met. C.S. Lewis again says, let's compare our sexual desire to every other kind of desire that we know. Uh, maybe even think about one that's really obvious and in common, our hunger, our food. I've already talked about it a little bit, right? Has anybody ever been hungry? Is anybody really acquainted with your food desire? Yes, I love it. It's, I love food. It's good. It's so good. Uh, so it makes sense. You get hungry, you eat. C.S. Lewis says, if you take a closer look in a couple specific ways, you'll see that playing with sexuality, playing with lust is playing with fire because it's such a different and unique kind of desire. He says, first, first and foremost, sex is different because the appetite for it surpasses, far surpasses the actual need of it. The appetite for it far surpasses the actual need. What he's saying is uh, most of us know what it is to be hungry and to eat. Um, most of us know that sometimes our hunger and desire is more than we actually need. Yes? You know what I'm saying? All right, it's not really reflected up here. I'm really tall, and so I carry my weight all over me. So I'm, I'm a fat guy in this body because um, I just eat ridiculous amounts, and it's not healthy. My heart, it's not good. But we know, I know what it is for my hunger desire to surpass my need, to eat beyond my need. Yes? Raise your hand for that if you want to. That's no more today. That's it. All right? We know what it is. And so C.S. Lewis says, sure, our hunger surpasses our need, but most of us, for the most part, maybe we'll eat enough for two people, but we're not going to eat enough for ten people. We can't. Okay? He says, the problem, the difference with sexual desire is that some of us, as we try to satisfy that desire, if, if given the chance, would be able to satisfy that for 100 people. And he quotes the fact that if you give a young man a chance, that he could father a village because our desire far surpasses our need when it comes to sexuality. Okay? Does that make sense? That's enough for a thousand if given the chance. That's a powerful difference. All right, not only that, um, he says, take a look at the nature of the desire. He says, second, the degree of desire when it comes to sexuality is so different from food and hunger. He says, imagine with me a country that if you visited and their strip clubs were filled with food. 
Okay, so you walked into a, a strip club in some weird, weird walk country. Uh, and the curtains come back, and on stage there's a stool, and there's a, uh, a tablecloth on top of the stool, and somebody comes out, and they just slowly lift the cloth. And there's a cheeseburger under there. <laughs> right? And you slowly get to see that bun a little bit, the sesame seeds, right? a little bit of beef patty, and the cheese, the pickle, and the onion, and people are just going, oh, throwing money at it, right? <laughs> yeah? Okay, and we would think that those folks were insane, particularly if they weren't just starving. We almost would make sense out of that if, if these were a starving people, but imagine that they're perfectly satisfied, normal folk, but still, we would think they're nuts because that would be the desire gone corrupt. That would be an obvious case of the desire gone corrupt, but that is exactly where we go with our sexual desire. We go to strange places. He said, third, along the same lines, we know that sexual desire is different because of the perversion that we find with it. He says this, I like this a lot. He says, when it comes to the food desire, he says, people rarely want to eat things that aren't really food. People rarely want to eat things that aren't really food or to do things with food other than eating it. Can we agree? People rarely want to do things with food other than eating it. When it comes to our sexual desire, we see that perverted in so many uh, ways that I can't talk about, that you know, things that you've had hints of or heard of, okay? So when it comes to food, think about this with our sexual desire, rarely do people want to eat things that aren't really food or do things with food other than eating it. We do crazy stuff, crazy, crazy stuff, foul and evil and manipulative and controlling stuff when it comes to our sexual desire. That, those things together should, should hint to us that this is a different thing than just I'm hungry. It's natural. Let's roll. Right? It's a different kind of thing. And C.S. Lewis points out, really Jesus points out, that this desire is unique, uniquely powerful and so powerful it's not to be played around with. Um, he says ultimately you hear Jesus' words, it will cause you to stumble. It will cause you to be entangled to the point that your life is in jeopardy. And so if we try to say, it's just, it's a part of me. I'm just going to live with it. It's going to coexist in my heart. Jesus says, I don't care if it's as important to you as your eye or your hand. It needs to go. And he doesn't talk about antibiotics to treat the infection. He talks about amputation. It needs to go. Cut it off. Throw it away. Figuratively. That's real, real talk. So Jesus says, don't play around. Uh, there's so much at stake. Um, we need to dwell on that a little bit and think about that for each of us. The last half of today, really, as we close, we can't leave it there because Jesus has more to say. It's important. Um, we're also going to hear from John chapter 8 really briefly. So don't worry. It's not like a second sermon. I like last week, sorry. John chapter 8. You're familiar with this. You may not have made a connection that we're going to make in a minute. It says, Early in the morning, Jesus came to the temple. All the people came to him, and he sat down and began to teach them. This is a totally different episode. It says, The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery. And making her stand before all of them, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in the very act of committing adultery. Now in the law of Moses, we were commanded to stone such women. Now what did you say? Hmm. They said this to test him, so that they may have, might have some charge to bring against him. But Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, Let anyone among you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. And once again, he bent down and wrote on the ground. When they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the elders. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Jesus straightened up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, sir. Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go your way, and from now on, do not sin again. Good word. 
we need to also, of all, maybe of all commandments, I feel like we need to also hear very firmly from, from the side of grace when it comes to our sexuality and adultery. Uh, because so many times, it's such a, a terrible deal we have for ourselves in this culture. At the same time our culture applauds our open sexuality, throws sexual images right in front of us, and porn is rampant, it's insane. Sex, sex, sex. But at the same time, agree or disagree, our culture has still a pretty hard deal for those who've gone down the road of sexual impurity. In other words, we still really value that white dress at the wedding in some ways. We still really value virginity. I'm, I'm glad. We still value sexual purity. Sexual sin is one of the, the least forgivable sins in our entire culture. We still do that. What a hard deal drive for us as human beings to just exalt sex and then say if you do it though you'll never get it back and you'll never be the same. Is that not a hard deal? And to me it's a heinous thing because yes we need to think about how, how real sexual sin is but good gravy. Do you know what it is when somebody crosses that line? And maybe in your life and because you've crossed this unheard of unspoken line and you can never go back and you can never get it back you just keep going in that direction further across the line. A sense of, I'm done, I've done it, I can't get it back, it's over. That is a terrible place for our culture to live. And so it's really important for us to hear in John chapter 8. We're familiar with this story. With the lady being about to be stoned, and Jesus says, whoever is without sin. Maybe you didn't always connect the dots that it was a woman caught in the act of adultery. Okay? That's really significant. Because as much as we need to, to really elevate our sense of how serious sexuality is, we have got to keep a really firm grip of God's grace with it. Okay? Because that's the nature of our sexuality. It, it forms a bond. Uh, it forms habits. So some of us go to pretty dark places in sexual sin. And it can feel totally unforgivable. And it can feel totally irredeemable. But we need to know that that's just not true. Yeah? Do you know that? Jesus wants us to know that because he wants us to repent and leave it behind. And not believe that it is just who we are now. And it is something that we'll never undo. Jesus says, he doesn't take it lightly. He says, go and sin no more. But first he says, neither do I condemn you. We've got to keep those two together. Do you agree? Can we agree? Amen. Okay. So today, we reckon with these things. Jesus talked about cutting it off like a surgery. To take it serious, good gravy, to take it so serious. Um, to think about what's at stake. At the same time, to never let sin dominate us. The theme of our series is boundless. It's about freedom and true freedom. So here we are. I want you to reckon with that yourself. We're going to have a time of prayer. We always close with prayer. But today's a special time of prayer. I really want you to pray through this prayer with me as you will. Um, because sexual sin clings so closely. And it is so far reaching and powerful. Uh, we need time to confess together. Uh, maybe you said, well I've tried to confess and turn my back on before. And I just always fall right back into it. Maybe you've never prayed about it as a body with other believers. Because we are praying together today. And asking for the Holy Spirit to move in our midst. So we can give that a shot today. Um, and secondly, we are going to be your graceful community be with you in the long term, each of us, as we wrestle with our sexual sin. Can we do that? Okay, I invite you to join me. Let's pray. Father, we know we know we have a strong sense, most of us, how powerful our sexuality is. But we know that it is one of the coolest and most excellent experiences you've bestowed on us and that you have given it to us. But we know at the same time that because it is so powerful and influential, it can be ill-used and manipulated and sold short and treated lightly. And when we do it, we feel like we treat ourselves lightly. We devalue ourselves and others. So we, we confess, each of us, across a huge spectrum, Lord, let us pause now and confess in our hearts before you the specific things that we want to say no to, repent from comes to our sexuality and our sexual health and our faithful relationships. And Lord, we take that time now. And 
So those are very real needs in our midst. Things that are so pervasive, like pornography, and unfaithfulness, and images in the media, or the premarital sex, and the pressures amongst all those things. Or for the lust of the eyes and the heart, or even for the lust of companionship, we felt ourselves drawn to another person other than our spouse because they listened to us or gave us emotional attention or were in other ways fulfilled something that we ought to have directed at our husbands and wives. We lift those things up to you. Lord, for habitual sin, for the things that cling so closely, things that we've wrestled with for years even, for the things that we hate that we do but that we still do, we pray for your freedom your promise to set us free. Come Holy Spirit, work in our hearts. We are humble to it. Lord. We say no to those things in our lives. We turn our backs on them as the things that you tell us will lead to death. So help us to amputate. Well, at the same time, uh, for many of us, we pray for what it is to still value ourselves, to find a way to believe that we can still be pure again and set free. Lord, sometimes we know that we cling to our sexual sin because we feel like we've got no alternative anymore. So we pray that you call us up into redeemed life. We can be made white like snow. Uh, Wash clean even of these deep abiding connections that our sexuality makes between us and other people and other things. So we pray that you would break those bonds and help us to turn our attention towards you, our God. Give you thanks for these things. We pray for them in the authority of Christ's name, for his blood shed for us. So together, all God's people can say, Amen. Amen.